Cool. I mean, the great thing about the Dev Toolkit uh, track is it covers a lot of different uh, areas. We're, we're now going to move on to a couple of completely different things. We're looking at uh, internationalization, trying to say that quickly, three times fast, content and diversity, and uh, reaching new markets through technology. Uh, we've got TransPerfect here. Uh, Kayla, is that correct? Yep. Come on, Kayla, come to the stage. 15 minutes. That's all the time I have today to explain one of the most overlooked pieces of taking your game global which is localization. And so some of you in the audience might already know what that is. So can I just get a quick poll? Raise your hand if you think you know what localization is. OK, a few of you. That's good. So for those of you that don't know what localization is, let me clarify. Um, localization is often confused with translation. So for us today, we're going to consider localization as the entire process of adapting your content or your brand or your product for a specific location or market. So translation is a piece of that puzzle, but it's not the only piece you have to consider, right? So this includes um, adaptation of cultural nuances, market preferences, altering art assets, creating new packaging sometimes, adapting your manuals. It can also mean re-recording content or audio. It can mean cutting out parts of your game which are potentially illegal or don't meet legal requirements in certain markets. And it can potentially mean re-recording content to replace the cut content, right? And so I spent the last 10 years in localization working across several different industries. And what we, sent, what we tend to see in all the different industries is that after, uh, localization is thought of as an afterthought. So it's something that comes at the very end after I thought of my game, I thought of my project, I've launched it in English or whatever your source language is. And then I'm like, oh no, now I have to localize it or I want to launch in other markets, right? And so you see game developers and publishers who spend hundreds and thousands and millions of dollars developing their game, right? They might take years or months creating the perfect game, look and feel and style. And then uh, two weeks before they're about to launch, they'll call up a translator and say, hey, can you translate my whole entire game in eight days? And you wonder why it doesn't work out well, right? So I wanted to show you a few things of what can go wrong when you don't take localization into account. I'm sure a lot of you know some of these headliner global uh, failures that you'll see. For example, um, don't worry, I didn't do any gaming ones yet. I don't want to embarrass anyone in the audience. Um, Coors Light, for any of you that speak Spanish, um, this colloquially means get diarrhea. So that wasn't a great one, making you want to drink a beer. Um, one of my favorites, it's, it's quite old, nothing sucks like an Electrolux. So that was a uh, translation into English, which it makes sense for a vacuum, but it also, you know, isn't the greatest. And lastly, even giants like Coca-Cola, right? You think like, oh, someone who's this big, who has this much marketing budget and money and resources won't make a mistake. When Coca-Cola originally launched their name in China, there was two different versions of what it meant, depending on the dialect. One was a uh, stuffed, I have to look because it's so weird, bite the wax tadpole or a female horse stuffed with wax. And Guo on my team can attest to this because we talked about it. And so in a desperate effort to change their brand name in China, they searched over 40,000 characters to try to find the match of these that means like tasty or delicious or happiness in your mouth. And so it's actually phonetically um, very similar. And so there's a couple fun ones um, for the gamers out there. These are old, so hopefully I'm no offending anyone. A winner is you from Ghostbusters. And welcome to die was Magento's X-Men's expression in English when it was translated poorly. Um, when I was preparing for this, this presentation, I actually looked up online. There's a Translation Gaming Fails Hall of Fame. So check it out. I mean, it's quite funny. I hope your game's not on there. But it's actually not really funny, right? Because what it means is that um, potentially business-wise, there's a lack of localization strategy, which can be really detrimental to the launch of your brand and your game, right? So I'm going to take you through a few things today on how to ensure that you can avoid you know, all of these things and avoid being on the Gaming Translation Failure Hall of Fame. So, but before we get into that, um, I want to say, I want to ask, you know, why, why should this matter to me? Or why do I care? Why can't I just publish my game in English, right? So let's start by zooming out and looking at the opportunities that exist today, which were already actually covered in the opening presentation. So I think it's just great to talk about them again. So the gaming market is going to be about $200 billion, $200 billion, guys, in just a mere two years, right? So there's a huge opportunity out there. Um, 
It's worth looking at um, some of the reports that came out. So this is by New Zoo. We're all quoting them. They're great. Um, if you look at 1.6 billion players in Asia Pacific, right? We're looking at specifically um, recent studies are talking about Southeast Asia countries like Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. So they're making up a large percent of that specific region's growth. And then we want to zoom in on Latin America and uh, Middle East and Africa, where you're having huge year-on-year -year growth in terms of players which is mostly due to the growth in the online population, right? And the increasing infrastructure that they have in the region, which is gonna mean there'll be more players for all of you. And so another report I really liked were these two from App Annie, it's Macro Mobile Trends Report. And you can see among the top 20 countries that they have, only two of them are English speaking countries, right? So English isn't gonna be enough if you wanna reach all the global players that are out there. And so what does this mean for you? I'm gonna break it down and give you four tips on key considerations for localizing your game when you wanna go global. The world is becoming more global, people are more connected, and as you launch your game, you have to be thinking about where are these players coming from if you wanna increase your revenue, your downloads, and your player experience ratings, right? So I recently caught up with an industry expert um, over Zoom just before the event, and she had been telling me she's working in localization at a game company for about 12 years. And just before COVID, she had been at an event in person, and the likes of Square Enix and Disney were telling her that even in 2019, so two years ago, there were developers that were coming to them with these great games, and they were still committing mistakes that made it very difficult for them to then localize or launch their game in other markets. So for example, developers were hard coding the text onto the game, which makes it impossible or, or very difficult and time consuming and costly to localize, right? So it doesn't matter where you are in your localization journey. Um, if you're a giant publisher and you have a localization team, if you're an indie developer and you've never thought about it, but you're trying to figure it out, I'm gonna give you four considerations on how to do the best practices for localizing. So the first one, don't leave it as an afterthought, right? Um, I've already mentioned that a couple of times, but I'm just gonna keep harping on it until you all leave remembering Kayla's presentation. Don't leave it as an afterthought. So there's a lot of risks, as I mentioned, um, if you don't consider it up front, because it will be twice as costly and take twice as long later. So give yourself enough time, right? Um, to, to give you like an example, um, or some context. So a normal translation team, which you guys don't really care about, but just for context, can translate about 2,000 words a day, right? And a tester, a linguistic tester, can test about 8,000 words per day. So if you think about like a 3 million word MMO game, like you're gonna need months, even if you use several teams to translate and localize your full game, let alone the testing, regression testing, bug fixes, regression testing again, right? So um, if you're a hyper casual mobile title with maybe a couple thousand words, you can get it done in a couple weeks, right? Um, and then secondly, there's some best practices around the actual designing of the content. So please, like I said, don't hard code text into your game. Think about expansion. You'll need special characters, potentially, you know, a lot of people forget that there are languages that go from right to left instead of left to right. Um, you also need to think about design interface, uh, dates, times, and formats, things that might need to be changed or adapted for different markets. Remember that icons and colors mean different things in different markets as well. So the very typical one is, you know, red, what the meaning is in the West versus in the East. Um, and don't forget about, you know, like I said, languages that can go from right to left or special characters if, if those are markets that you want to look at. An example of this recently that I came across was a really simple puzzle mobile game that they had actually launched and they, they had expected to launch into a few specific markets. And the game was actually picked up in markets that they weren't expecting and they started to get downloads. However, since they hadn't adapted or localized their app storefront, um, they weren't able to really ride the wave where they could have gotten more and more people to download. Um, like think of Wordle, for example. Now there's Wordle in Spanish, there's Wordle in a lot of different languages. So as those games get picked up and you see in different markets, people are starting to like your game. Like how quickly can you react to get your game localized? And then lastly, it becomes part of your cycle, right? So you can't just think like, oh, it's one and done. Like I translated my game and now I'm never gonna have to think about this horrible thing again. No, you have to remember that every time you make a release, every time you make updates to the game, you're gonna have to think, how long is it gonna take to do it in the other markets? How long is it gonna take to localize, to translate, to test? 
So remember to incorporate that into your, into your, pro, into your projects. And then lastly, um, that's, um, sorry. <laughs> and then lastly, um, no, that's the wrong one. <laughs> sorry, here we go. And then the second consideration. So provide context. In our industry, across all different um, sectors, travel, retail, banking, finance, one of the biggest challenges is having context, right? So strings get exported from files and you get random words or strings and someone says translate this. So two, uh, well, I think there's three things in this section that I want you to think about. One is the context of the translators you're working with and making sure you're finding translators that you know, are actually gamers or that know about the gaming industry. And obviously if you can give them as much access as possible to your game, the better. And some of the things you should think of here are, are you giving them glossary of key terms like MPSIs, which we call names, places, skills, or items in your game? Um, are there terms that should not be translated? The other thing is, for example, are you giving them a game design document or video access, a stream? If not, can you please at least give them a screenshot so that they know what they're translating, right? And then um, clarifying things like what platforms to, is it going to be played on? And then creating query logs. And you might ask, like, what, what's a query log? Um, basically, it's something where if you don't have enough context, even if you're a great translator, um, you could leave questions for the dev or production teams. That gets sent back to them. They'll answer the questions around that context. And then it'll go back to the localization team to fix if needed, and then import it back into the game, and then test it, right, in context. So um, another example of this is actually a Italian a publisher. They had a lot of challenges of this up front, but their localization team actually began to solidify these steps, which helped them speed up their SIM ships and SIM launches of all the languages and markets. And they've published over 200 games in eight languages. So by pre-writing game references, character limitations, um, their GDD, they've been able to really, really speed up the process and make sure it goes smooth and it's the best quality of a game. And the third consideration. Leveraging existing technology. I know there's tons of technology out there, VR, AR, you know, NFTs, we're talking about blockchain, but there's a few things related to localization that can be really helpful in developing your game for other markets. So the first is translation memory. Basically, this is a tool uh, or a database that saves all the content you've previously translated. And why does that matter, right? Well, one, it means you're going to have a consistent experience across all your channels, all your different platforms, in every different space, right? And maybe the best one is you're never gonna pay twice for the same translation, right? So you'll have cost savings as well. And it also standardizes how the translators can actually translate the content. So it doesn't matter if it's app, web, coded, XML, CSV, JSON files, they're able to work in this context in this tool. And then the second one is audio recording in the cloud. So historically, um, like 20 years ago, a AAA game would support maybe 500 lines of dialogue, right? And it was usually just in one or two languages. And today, a typical, a typical AAA game can easily feature between 50 to 100,000 lines of dialogue. That's a lot of dialogue to record, right? And it's not uncommon to see those games or titles in 12 to 15 languages. And so there's a revolution happening around the technology around audio, being able to record in the cloud, being able to interact with the live talents in, on the cloud or in the studio in real time. And this reduces costs around sending bulky transfers where you used to even have to have specific tools or platforms to be able to send these audio files, right? And then lastly, the democratization of voice talents is what I like to say. Historically, there was a monopoly, let's say, on the people that could do voice recordings or that were high-end voice talents. And so it was a really high in cost and usually they would charge you, right, to travel to the major cities or the studios and they would charge you for their lodging and their hotel. And you're like, wow, this is really unaffordable. And so there's a really funny example that I love. I'm from Spain um, where subbing, uh, subtitling, dubbing and voiceovers are very common. Everything is dubbed. And so there's a historically a guy named Jordi Brau and he would dub over 10 Hollywood actors. This is the same guy. He was doing Robin, Robin Williams, Tom Cruise, Dennis Quaid, Sean Penn. I was like, this guy just, imagine trying to get on his calendar and imagine how much it would cost you. So now with the opportunity to be able to record from home studios, there's a lot more voice talents that are being trained, that are being available to, to record the content in any home studio with the same high quality. 
And there's a lot of even Netflix and HBO series that during the last two years were recorded at home, right? So you don't have to worry about like, oh, that's going to be really poor quality. It's, it's really top quality if the OTTs and entertainment fields are using them as well. And then lastly, test, test, and test again. And this one's always a fun one because a lot of times developers will come to us and be like, oh, well, if I already translated my game and there are good translators and I'm going to have high quality translations, why do I have to test, right? And what someone said to me recently that I really loved was, OK, well, if you're such a great developer, why do you have to do functional testing on your builds, right? And so testing is a really essential part of the process. Um, linguistic or localization QA, linguistic testing teams will detect text that doesn't fit in your boxes, that's not fully visible, that will make your text wonky or covering up, which is really critical because it can affect the UX or the user experience, which in the end is really critical when the quality or the perceived quality of your game um, will likely affect your retention right, of your, of your players and the lifetime value of those players if they realize that you know, it's not being taken care of in their markets. So make sure you're testing in all your languages, on all your devices, and all the different platforms. And to wrap up, these are the four areas that I think you really need to remember when you're thinking about taking your game international. The first, don't leave localization as an afterthought, right? Think about timing, think about giving resources to your teams, and don't hard code your text, please, if that's the only thing you take away today. The second is around the context. Again, use the right translator. A translator is just not any translator, right? Find them in the right context, in the right vertical. Make sure you're providing as much context in terms of style guides, character guides, character limitations, anything that you can share with the teams. Leverage the existing technology, because there's great tools out there today that can make things more cost affordable and faster for time to market. And then test, 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 and test again. Um, so the question really is and is, Kayla, how much should I pay for a translation? Or what's the price per word that's good on the market? That's what you'll come and ask me at my booth later. Um, what you should be asking yourself is, can I succeed in this market without localization? 40% of internet users will not shop on websites that aren't localized, and 64% are actually willing to pay more if the, local, if the product is in their local language. So how do you avoid being on the game, Gaming Translations Fails Hall of Fame? When you do localization correctly, you can take your niche title into an international phenomenon, and when done poorly, you'll end up here. So that's why understanding that the process of video game localization is critical for publishers who want to take their games global and increase their sales internationally. And that's all. Um, I think I'm a little over on time. So if you guys have any questions or want to know more, we actually have our booth upstairs. It's right on the corner when you walk up. And me and my team will be available all day. And you can email or connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, okay. Yeah. I think we need to get your mic. I think she's just grab your, your mic. Ah. So that was whilst we're, we're whilst uh, that was fan fantastic. Look, there's a lot of paper there. That's like reminds me. I that's okay. No, it's great. Um, but I thought it was really in, in interesting, really insightful, and, and uh, yeah, we have sort of learned a lot there. Um, I was going to ask you, does anybody have a question? Because we do have time for one question. Probably, is, is there a question for Transperfect? Over there. Oh, over there. <laughs> He's waving. He's stretching. Sorry, I can't. This the light's right in your face. That was a great presentation. Really Thank love you so all the much. graphics. Hello. You were on, yep. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the, the value of localizing uh, globally and, and thinking, having, having that global mindset. How do you think about the trade-off between, obviously, you could keep localizing and localizing in more and more and more languages, but there's going to be this sort of long tail where the ROI of doing it starts to become negative. Um, how do you think about evaluating that if you're going into it sort of without any existing data about where the ROI is? Um, is that I'll just talk really loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question because that's something that comes up a lot and you'll see with like large publishers and large companies, right? There's always going to be a point on the access on the axis where it doesn't make sense, right? To keep investing. And especially in terms of, um, for example, the, what I said about reporting. Obviously, it is more cost effective these days, but there is content that it doesn't make sense uh, financially, right? So you're going to have to look at things like trends in the market, you know, um, one of the things we can do is we have like consultants that can look at trends that are existing, comparisons with other games, but also um, in terms of like your own game, right? You have to look at the data around your game 
and the potential. So there's there's obviously like a capex or a cost analysis you have to do up front to look at that. It depends on each game, really. Cool. Fantastic. And on that, we got you a question, but that was, do go check them out at the booth and, and do, do uh, ask questions thank there. But thank you so much for that presentation.